I search the world But it couldn't fill me Hands empty bread Treasures of pain Never
Pastor Charles is down in his back this morning. Um, just took too much out of him marrying little Rosita off last week. I mean, last Friday night. She got married, and uh, he's down in his back, and so can't make it today. So he asked me if I'd give you the announcements. So here they go. First one is tonight, Bible study is canceled. Next one, Bible study Thursday night is canceled. See him on a roll here. <laughs> And then uh, the next one is not canceled, but uh, I ask that you remember uh, Johnny Walker, his family, his sister, uh, Miss Bonnie Harris, passed away this morning. That's his last one um, in his family. So I ask that you remember them. As soon as we get the details, we'll pass that along to you. But he got that message uh, as he got here to church this morning. So remember them. And then the next ones are all related. First of all, all Operation Christmas Child. That is being kicked off today. If you want to pack boxes on your own, the boxes will be available at both doors on your way out. You can grab those, and there's no charge for that. You just take those boxes. You can pack those at home. If you want to do that, you're welcome to do that, and we'd be grateful if you would do that. And if you don't want to, then on October the 3rd, that's a Sunday evening, we will be... I'm sorry? October the 30th. What did I say? Okay. Well, I just dropped a zero. <laughs> I'm new at this, right? Give me a break. Uh, packing party October the 30th on Sunday evening. And uh, their goal to pack that evening is 350 boxes. So if you want to come help us that night... We'd be grateful you do that as well. We'll have everything there. You just go through the line, pack the stuff, and you can go through uh, another time or two if you want to. So that'll be on October the 30th. And then if you don't want to do either one of those, but you still want to be involved, then you can pack online. And uh, information on those for doing that, there's cards on the back table back there. You just scan that card, go to a, a website, and uh, <clears throat> you can just pick and choose things that you want in the boxes, and uh, that'll get done for you. And as a matter of fact, last year, I got to be involved in that and did that over in Boone, North Carolina. Some folks had packed some online, and we got the list. We, I got to pick the stuff, and so that was kind of cool. And then one day, uh, I just was uh, helping sort the boxes that we, or different folks had packed, not any of ours that I found, but they would come through, and we have to go through the boxes because some of y'all forget what you can and cannot put in there. And so I had to take stuff out, and <clears throat> they had this little 20-something-year-old girl that was in charge of our table, and there was five, six of us adults at the table packing and checking the boxes, and every now and then a box would come through with candy in it. We had to take the candy out. So this one box came through. It had, had one candy, one chocolate, Hershey Kiss in it. And I said, oh, man, just one kiss. I said, I can, I, surely I can let this one chocolate Hershey Kiss go through. And the girl looked at me, and she said, you can. I said, oh, awesome. And she said, but if you want that box to go, and let's say that it goes to Uganda. I said, okay. She said, and it gets to Uganda, and it gets to Customs. And they open that box, and it has one piece of candy in it. Did you realize that they would confiscate all of those boxes? So that you would be responsible for 373 kids not getting a shoe box. So I just opened the, unwrapped the kiss and ate it. <laughs> oh, and I got in trouble for that too, by the way. But anyway, because <laughs> everything like that, they ship off and, and donate it to another organization that, that can take it. But anyway, just wanted to let you know, we're involved in that right now. Our church goal is like 578 this year, most we've ever done. So the tree will be up next Sunday and uh, be emphasizing that now until November the 20th. Maybe it's the 15th. Sometime in November. How about let's just go with that, all right? So that's the announcements for today. And you'll have some at the end of the service. We appreciate you being here and joining with us today. And uh, let me have a word of prayer for uh, Johnny Walker's family. Father, we come to you right now, ask you to cleanse and forgive us. Thank you for all that you do and are doing in our midst. Lord, it's been a, <clears throat> a long week, a lot of things going on with a lot of different families. 
some good and some bad and some rough. And Lord, we just pray that you would be with all those families. I pray you'd be with Johnny's family now as they minister to one another and take care of one another. And Lord, I just pray you'd give him a peace and a comfort. This was his, this was his twin sister. And Lord, I pray you'd be with him a special day today and give him the blessing that only you can deliver, only you can comfort, and only you can watch over and care for. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Watch this video from Operation Christmas Child. Let the little children come to me. Don't forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. Operation Christmas Child is a way for the little children to come to Almighty God. That is the best gift of all, is becoming part of God's family. The mission of Operation Christmas Child never changes. Children are coming to Jesus, children are being discipled, and children are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. These children are brave and bold, not afraid, and they're not ashamed of the gospel. They're trained and equipped to go out and share their faith with others, and many times in areas where it's an unreached people group, the Bible tells us the time is now. Let them come, Jesus said, let them come. And they're coming. They're coming by the millions. Every single box represents the life of a young boy, a young girl, who will be touched by the gospel. Jesus has come to give them light, that they do not need to be in the darkness, that they have hope, that they have joy. And it is our prayer that this glorious light of the gospel will flow among the nations and will fill our land with the knowledge of the glory of God. The Lord God Almighty desires to fulfill His redemptive plan for mankind in and through each of us and all of us. All of us are children of God. We share this incredible opportunity to take the gospel truly to the ends of the earth by gathering children to Jesus. I believe this year for Operation Christmas Child, this may be the most important year, most important opportunity that we'll ever have to reach children in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise that God will use these shoebox gifts to make a difference in the children's life for eternity. privilege it is that we can help out with this wonderful organization um let's stand and let's conti continue to worship god together this morning <clears throat>
good and worthy to be praised. And as we continue to sing this morning, just remember that no matter what you're going through, God is always faithful. Blessings of life, Lord, for these cool days that are coming, Lord, and we'll get to see the beauty of transformation of the leaves. Lord, I just pray that you feel Brother Ray with your word, Lord. Open our hearts to be receptive to your word, Lord, and Lord, we just pray that you be with all the families that have suffered losses and are going through illness. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
we should never, ever, ever, ever forget what Jesus Christ has done for us. People have asked when I came in this morning, and when they saw Ann, when they saw me, they said, y'all get into a knockdown drag out? And I said, well, that's the rumor. But the truth is, I had a squamish cell, skin cancer taken off the side of my head. I got four stitches on the inside, eight stitches on the outside, and Ann had an encounter with a tree branch when she was cutting grass, and the tree branch won. So she's got a red eye, and I've got a patch on the side of my head. So that's, that's the truth, but you can believe anything you want to, okay? And uh, <clears throat> so anyway, um, I have been sharing with you uh, last week and also this week uh, and the next two weeks about the Southern Baptist Convention, Tennessee Baptist Convention. Uh, last week I talked about the kind of the early history of Baptists and how we got into the country. And in 1814, uh, the Triennial Convention was organized in Philadelphia, led by Luther Rice. There was a seminary named for him down in Georgia. And um, they formed the convention called the Triennial Convention because they only met every three years. But in 1845, the Southern Baptists, uh, the people of the Baptists of the South, pulled out, formed their own convention called the Southern Baptist Convention, primarily over the fact that the people in the North would not allow a, a man who, had, uh, who was a slave owner uh, to be uh, commissioned as a missionary to go overseas. So the Southern Baptist Convention uh, split off, formed their own convention, and became very mission-minded uh, in, in so many different ways, whereas the Northern Convention uh, eventually uh, filtered into more of a liberalism type uh, approach and very not being very missionary but the Southern Baptist Convention has been very missionary over the years and when they were organized they had a lot of agencies like uh, foreign missions, home missions and different other groups that were affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention and each one of these groups would go around to individual churches and they would spend time talking about the work that they were doing. And in 1925, uh, well, before 1925, a few men got together and decided that wasn't going to work because it was just, you know, some agencies uh, had a better presentation than others. And so consequently, in 1925, at the Southern Baptist Convention meeting in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, the cooperative program was uh, adopted and uh, the cooperative program has been in existence ever since then and it's been the mainstay of support for the Southern Baptist Convention and I'll get into that next week uh, sharing with you about what the cooperative program does. The Tennessee Baptist Convention came a little later than uh, the Southern Baptist Convention. There were several attempts made to organize a uh, a convention in Tennessee uh, prior to 1874, uh, but it was in 1874 that the Tennessee Baptist Convention was organized, and, um, and I'll share a little bit more about what they do in reference to the cooperative program because it all ties together, the Tennessee Baptist and Southern Baptist kind of tie together. Um, several years ago, uh, the Tennessee Baptist Convention renamed itself, and now they're called the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board and um, in fact we'll be meeting in November, the second week of November uh, in uh, Cordova which is near Memphis. So anyway, next week I will be sharing with you, it gives you a little idea how the convention uh, came into existence and uh, next week as I said I'll share with you about um, how we are funded and the different things that that money goes to support. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the, this place and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way unto the Lord and trust also in him and he will bring it to pass. And he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. And then in Isaiah 30, 21, scripture for today, it says, you and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. 
whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. It's a great verse because we need to always remember that God is speaking to our hearts, speaking in our ears, and telling us, don't do that. Don't go there. This is the way I want you to go. This is the way I want you to walk. Do that which I have commanded you to do, and you will have good life. I appreciated the fact that the song that the choir sang this morning, uh, we, we will remember. We must remember. We must never, ever, ever forget what Jesus Christ has done for us. Because without him, without his goodness, without what he does in our life, we are lost. This morning I want to share with you three words. Remember, rejoice, respond from Ephesians chapter 2. The Bible can really be looked at in a lot of ways as perhaps a history, a living history of God working to redeem, restore his people unto himself. Probably all have read the first three chapters of Genesis. You know the first two chapters. The first chapter, God created the world, and after each time he said it was good until he got to man, and then he said it was very good that he made man. Chapter 2 talks about how he made man and woman and placed them in the garden and told them to be caretakers of the garden. It was a perfect place. They spent all of their time communicating and fellowshipping with God as well as doing the things that God instructed them to do while in the garden. And the only thing that they had, the only negative thing in the garden at the time, as you well know, God said, do not eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Many people think it was an apple. I don't know what it was. Anyway, whatever it was, it looked good. And then we come to chapter 3. And chapter 3 is when the wheels fall off, when everything goes to pot. When God had told Adam and Eve, this is what you should do, and then all of a sudden Eve is alone and the serpent comes, and a lot of people think it was a snake curled around a, a tree. No, I don't think it was a snake at that time. I think the snake came later. But whatever it was, Satan did not frighten her, and he told her, he said, you know, God really, really wanted you to eat that tree. He said, and, and, and as far as dying is concerned, you're not going to die. God's not going to kill you. They didn't even know what death was. But he convinced her to take the fruit and eat of the fruit. And then when Adam came along, she gave Adam the fruit. They both had their eyes open and they realized that they were unclothed, that they were naked before God. And they were embarrassed to be in the garden in that state, so they grabbed some fig leaves and pull around them. And, and finally God clothed them and was gracious to them, even in spite of their sin. And then the Bible goes on and talks about uh, the flood, talks about the Tower of Babel, talks about uh, how all of the, the things began to just come unraveled. All of the good things that God did for the people of, of Israel, uh, who were not the people of Israel at the time, but all that God did for the people of his creation, it just came unglued. And so God called a man, a man named Abram, who lived in a far country. And God said, I want you to come over here. I've got a place I want you to live a place you have never seen, a place you know not of. I want you to come over here and I want you to live. And God gave Abraham a promise. He gave him a covenant between he and God as found in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, 
and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you and will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So in looking at that passage, just see what God was saying to Abram. First of all, he spoke directly to Abram, which is something Abram had never experienced before, but he heard the voice of God speaking directly to him. And then God said, pack up your family, get out of Dodge, and move to a place that you know not of. And God promised that through Abram a great nation would be brought forth, which is what happened. And God said that he would bless Abram and his descendants. And then God said that through Abram that he would bless the families of the earth, meaning that those who were favorable to Abram and his descendants would be blessed and those who, that cursed Abram and his descendants would be cursed. And that has carried forth all the way through the history, even up to today. Of course, the children of Abraham eventually became the children of Israel, which was Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whom God renamed Israel. And so they became the children of Israel. And then there came that time when they went into Egypt, and they spent 400 years in Egypt and eventually became slaves to the uh, Egyptian people. And then Jesus came on the earth. When Jesus came into the world, God had not spoken a word through a prophet or through anybody else for 400 years. And when Jesus came on the earth, the children of Israel were in a period of disobedience to God. They kind of rode a roller coaster with God. At times they were obedient, very much so, and other times they were disobedient. And this time when Jesus came into the world, they were in that stage of being disobedient. The, the, the prophets, were, the religious system uh, had fallen into sinful disarray. The religious leaders were self-centered. The people's lives were empty. And they were just going about their lives in hopeless despair And in some ways, that reflects what is going on in our life today. There are so many people in our world today, in our nation, who think they've got it all together, when in reality, they're living in a state of hopelessness. And so when Jesus Christ came into the world, he came as that light to bring hope to the hopeless. And so as we look at this this passage found in Ephesians chapter 2, we realize that that's what, exactly what the Apostle Paul was saying to the Ephesians. And you've got to realize that the Ephesians were Gentiles. There may have been a few Jews scattered here and there around, but for the most part they were Gentiles, and that was Paul's ministry, that was what he was called to do, and he went and he preached to the Gentiles, and those who got saved became a part of this church, the church at Ephesus, as well as other churches that the Apostle Paul had established in his missionary journeys. And so the Apostle Paul, in chapter 2 of Ephesians, after he had finished in his first chapter 1, he comes now to chapter 2, and he's talking to the people, and he is saying to them, I want you to understand that you need to remember You need to remember because he says in verses 1 through 3, he says, and you, you, meaning the Gentiles, you he made alive who were dead in trespasses of sins. So you got to understand that the Gentiles were not like the Jews. The Jews were born into a, a privileged society. At least that's what they thought. They thought that okay, because I'm a Jew or because I was born into the children of Israel, that that I'm okay, that God has blessed me and I don't have to worry about anything as long as I keep all the rituals that, that were established, I'll be okay. But what Paul is saying to the Gentiles, you were not okay. You were living in trespasses. You were living in sins. You were worshiping false gods that you had been taught to worship from the time you were born until now. 
And then he goes on to say, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So in other words, he's referring here to Satan. Satan is the one who leads people away from the truth. It's like I said this morning about the, what I've got and what Ann's got. The truth is this. The false is what you want to believe. And Paul is saying here that Satan has led through his power, his influence upon the lives of people, have led them into a state of disobedience to the Almighty God. Of course, they didn't know who God was. Nobody had ever taken time to tell them who God was. And so consequently, they just worshipped what they thought they should worship and thought they were okay. And then he says, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. And so consequently, what Paul is saying to these people in Ephesus is that that there was a time when you were walking in total disobedience to God. And then over in verse 11 and 12, he says, Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called the uncircumcision by that which is the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, and having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you once who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Often when I come to the statement about uncircumcision, circumcision, I always say, if you don't know what that means, ask your parents when you get home. But anyway, um, it's a sign that says that they were children of Israel. They were Jews. And the Gentiles were not children of Israel, so they did not have that mark upon them that set them apart as followers of Jehovah God. But then he says in verse 12, but at that time you were without Christ. You had no idea who Christ was until Paul came along and preached the gospel to them. And he says, because you were without Christ, you were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise having no hope I think those two words right there are the the hardest two words for anybody at least for me to grapple to think that there is a people in this world all over this world who have no hope and at one time you and I We're in that same condition that we had no hope until Christ came along, until someone came along and told us about Jesus Christ. I've shared with you about my experience at an RA camp, but it was that night on Thursday night when they had the evangelistic service that I realized that that I was lost and I had no hope outside of Jesus Christ. And I embraced the cross that night. And have not looked back. But then he says in verse 13. He says, but now in Christ, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So in other words, what happened was Paul preached the gospel. Preached the gospel to those in Ephesus. I've been to Ephesus. I've been to the old ruins of Ephesus. It's, it's quite a city back in the day, and um, people were quite wealthy back in Ephesus back in the day. And the Apostle Paul went into that city, and he preached the gospel. And those who would respond to the gospel got saved, and they went from having no hope to having hope in their life. So the Apostle Paul says, now that you have hope, Now that you remember what you were and what you are, you need to rejoice. It's a second word. Remember and rejoice. Why do they rejoice? 
Well, two words in verse 4. But God. Two words in verse 12, no hope. But in verse 4, but God. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love which he loved us, with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved by faith and raised up together and made to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. And then the two the verse, two verses that I love and I've memorized over the years, for by grace are you saved by faith. Not of works, not of ourselves, for it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I've been around a lot of people in my life and been around a lot of people who have boasted about a lot of different things. But the one thing that we cannot boast about from a human perspective, we cannot boast and say, I have saved myself. Salvation only comes through Jesus Christ and through him alone. And the children and the people in Ephesus, they heard the word from the Apostle Paul and they realized that they were living their lives with no hope. But now they can rejoice because they are children of God through Jesus Christ. Paul said, remember, rejoice that you're not there anymore. Rejoice. And then Paul said, <clears throat> in one verse, respond. Remember, rejoice, respond. For it says in verse 10, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now, if you remember back in verse 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then he follows right up with that by saying, But we are his workmanship. Wait a minute. If it's not by works, workmanship, what, what is it? And he says, He'll create it in Christ Jesus for good works, which God had prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in other words, the works that Paul was talking about in verse 9 is our works. Works that, that we do to earn points with God. And there are many religions in the world today who, who espouse that kind of faith. There are many people in the world who espouse no faith at all and say, well, because of my good works, God's going to take me to heaven because he's a good God. Well, he's not going to take you to heaven if you don't embrace the cross. If you don't give your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ on faith and trust and walk with him and saying, Lord, I'm nothing. Take me and use me. And that's where it comes in because I've said this before and I'll say it again is that because if all that God wanted to do in our life is to save us, we should have been out of here by now because we have a propensity to mess things up from time to time. But God left us here for a purpose and that is to share the gospel. Respond by sharing your faith. Respond by doing the things that need to be done to help other people. I've seen the commercials this week 
Billy Gr uh, Franklin Graham, who was talking about Samaritan's Purse and the response that they're making to the hurricane relief in Florida. And that is born out of faith. And, and as I watched him talk about those trucks and people who were going down, he didn't say that, that we're doing it to pat ourselves on the back because we're such good people. He said we're doing it because of our faith in Jesus Christ and that is one of the primary reasons why we do what we do is to tell people the truth about Jesus Christ and how he saves our lives and how he gives us strength to live each day. Remember, because there was a time, if you're saved, there was a time when you were lost and you were outside of the kingdom of God. But rejoice. If you have embraced the cross, rejoice because now you are saved. And you are in the kingdom of God. And he has promised to you and promised to me that when we die off of this earth that we're going to be in the presence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It is so refreshing. Like last Wednesday when I came to the funeral for Alan Russell, it's so refreshing to come to funerals of people that you know know Christ or knew Christ and you know that they are in his presence at this very moment. It's so hard to go to a funeral of someone who's lost because it breaks your heart if you know for certain that they never embraced the cross, if, if, if they had been talked to many times about receiving Christ and they rejected the cross and they died, you know where their eternity will be spent. I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. We struggle. But the one thing, the one thing that makes a powerful difference in our lives is that we're saved and in that we can rejoice. Because I know that when I die, I know where I'm going. And I know with whom I'm going to spend eternity. And that is my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. And I hope that everybody in this room this morning has that assurance. That you can remember where you were, but you can rejoice in where you are. And that you can respond to other people and tell them, this is what Jesus has done for me. And, and, and I just... Do all I can to beg you to embrace the cross because that's the only hope we have. And if you don't embrace the cross, there is no hope. Have you embraced the cross? Father, thank you for always providing for us the truth of your word, for giving us, oh God, the, the hope that we need in our life to be able to live in these troublesome days. The Apostle Paul faced troublesome days. All Christians from down through the centuries of time since Jesus died and arose from the grave, everyone who has followed Jesus Christ has faced troublesome days. What we're going through today is no different from what anybody else has gone through over, over periods of time. But oh God, I pray that as we, we remember the hopelessness that we had, that we, Lord, will rejoice in the fact that, that we now have hope in Jesus Christ and that we can respond by sharing with other people the glorious hope found only in Jesus Christ. 
And if there's anyone here today, Lord, who needs to make that decision in their life, who needs to say, Lord, I want to trust you. I want to give you my heart. I want to just take this time, Lord, just to say, I'm tired of living my life myself. I want to follow you and I want to trust you each step of the way. Whatever you may be speaking to the hearts of your people here this morning, Lord, I just pray that you will lead them to respond to your grace. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small child of weakness watch and pray find in me thine all in all Jesus paid it all all to Well, it's good to see everybody today. I know a lot of people are out on fall break, and um, this is a good good time to do it. It's, I don't think it's supposed to be in the rain until Wednesday or Thursday, but but anyway, hope you have a hope this has been a good day for you, and I hope it will continue to be so as we move forward. Um, and may God's blessing, rich blessings, be yours in all that you do on this day and each and every day that God grants us to live upon this earth. Andy. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, the hope that you've shown us and the love that you've poured out on us. And I pray that we take that love that you've shown us and we take it into the community as we go, as we live our lives and go to work, go to school, and just the things that we do on a regular basis, that we show the love that you've shown to us to the people around us. Um, and that reflects the love that you've shown us, and that draws them to you, uh, because you are our source of hope. We are not going to find hope anywhere else but in you. Thank you um, for Brother Ray's message um, as a reminder today of that hope and of that love. I probably sing in your son's name. Amen. <laughs>